So with the theme that we have with our music also applies to this message, because remember we're going through the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians, and we've talked about that if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and if you feed the Spirit with God's truth, some fruit are brought about. And we've talked so far about the fruit of joy, the fruit of First of all, love, then joy. Now we're going to talk about the fruit of peace. So turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, because that's where we're going to uh, look at this fruit of peace. As you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful that we can know you. That as we go through the hard times, we can learn about you and remember who you are to give us peace in these hard times. I pray that we would see your, see who you are today, your power be on this message, and help us to uh, apply this to our life in your name. Amen. Now, if I were to ask you what the most nerve-wracking thing you've ever done, what would you say it is? How many for you... Let's see if I do this work. I have problems with this during practice time. Um, no, this is a problem. Let's see how far up I have to go to get this to work. Well, um, Steve, you might have to stand in the back, and or Josh actually can do it. You might have to click through the floor, man. I don't, we've been having problems with this. I hope that was bad. There we go. Okay. I think it was just um, sweet. Yeah. Well, we'll see how the clicker does. I don't need you to help, help me, Josh, depending on how it does. And how many of you does this look like your worst nightmare? Do you know they say, like, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's something like one-third of the people would rather die than do public speaking. I don't know, maybe that's you. How about any of you uh, nervous the first time you were about to shoot an elk? Was that a little nerve-wracking for you? How about any uh, skydivers in here? I was just talking to Kenny yesterday, and he just went skydiving. Um, Steph, Steph and I did that, and I was doing it for, yes, yeah, Scott? Oh, Scott did, yeah. I'm sure Scott did a bunch of skydiving with the Army. Dave, why would you jump on a Because it's fun. <laughs> but, but for me, I had to know about it a week and a half in advance. It was, I was surprising Steph, so she just got there. She's like, great. But I had to worry about it for, for a week and a half. So maybe something that's been really nerve-wracking for you and you know it's coming up, what do we tend to do? We, we worry about it. And that's a natural thing. But if we ever worry too much about something, that can be really hurtful to us. And unfortunately, we don't just worry about those big things. We tend to worry about everything, right? No matter how small, we want to worry about it. Well, today we're going to talk about how we can have the opposite of worry and the opposite of worry is peace. And we're not just going to talk about any peace. We're going to talk about God's peace and how he offers it to us. So the first point we're going to see today is the peace of God described. So you're in Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, he starts off talking here about the peace of God. Now, let's think about what peace is in and of itself. You could say that peace is free from worry. Now, I think we all want calmness in our life. We don't like it when it's all crazy going on. How many of you like to fish? <laughs> and maybe one of the reasons you like to fish because it's kind of a calming experience. You know, you're out there. It's, it's supposed to be calm. You don't want to crazy that the fish might go away, but if you want calmness in your life, you can think of it like a sigh of relief. Maybe you have that spot where you go and it's just, oh, that's your calm spot. Um, how, how, how many of you know what this is? I think it's called like a zen garden. One of our friends had that. And evidently when you comb through the sand, it's supposed to calm you down. I don't know, that doesn't really seem like that to me, but some people say that. But the idea is that peace is free from worry. We all want this kind of peace. We don't want this craziness going on all the time and worrying all the time. 
And we're not just talking about any peace. This is the peace of God. And this peace of God, it describes it here in verse 7. This peace of God, it says, which passeth all understanding. That means you can't even fathom how good it is. Now, something that I'm realizing around here is that none of the Mexican restaurants do queso dip. You guys notice that? Because back home in South Carolina, all the Mexican restaurants have queso dip or cheese dip. And let me tell you, there was a Mexican restaurant called Corona's that had a cheese dip, queso dip, whatever you want to call it, that you cannot even believe. It was so good. In fact, I would go sometimes and just get cheese dip, and that would be my dinner. That's how good it is. He said, Paul saying that there is a peace that will blow your mind. You can't even comprehend how good it is. You could also put it this way, that it's so abnormal that it doesn't make sense. Even to the point that you could be going through a serious, major trial. You could be going through some kind of emotional trial. That could be something with maybe family members, friends that are just you're having emotional trials through that. It could be physical, or you're having a lot of physical problems. It could be relational, it could be financial. There could be some huge things going in your life. And if you have this peace of God, you can be calm and worry-free no matter what's happening. Now, we all want that. And he says that this peace of God, it says that it will rule your heart, which is your feelings, and your mind, which is your thoughts. So every part of you. So let me ask you, do you want this peace? Absolutely. So how do we get this? Well, the next point is in 6 and 8. It says, how to obtain the peace of God, give our worry to God. Because if you're saved, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you now have access to this peace of God. God says, I want you to have this. But let's say someone comes up to you and gives you a, say, I have this gift for you. What do we have to do? You have to take it, right? You can't just be like, that's great, and then not do anything. You have to take this piece. So how do, how do we take it? Well, look at verse 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So it says, be careful for nothing. Now what that means is, don't be anxious or about anything. Or you don't have to worry about anything. Now why don't we have to worry anything about anything? And well, before we get there, let's, let's talk about what is worrying in general. It makes me kind of think of this. You ever, you ever thought of that or seen people do that? You know, they're so worried, you know, they bite their fingernails. So worrying, you can describe it this way. It's thinking about something over and over and over again because we're being nervous about the outcome. And the reason we're doing that is we think, okay, if I think about this enough, if I think about it over and over again, then that will help me bring the outcome out for good. I feel like if I do that enough, I can control it enough. So that's what the idea behind worrying is. And what do we worry about? Well, it could be um, getting everything done at our job, having enough energy to parent our family, or you can be grandparents. I joke with uh, Lloyd and Deanne that they're more busy now that they're retired, watching all their grandkids play games all over the place. Uh, it could be being sick and injured, how to, how to pay the bills, but it could be even the smallest things. It could be our, our haircut. It could be, um, it could be even just things around our house. We can worry from the biggest to the smallest things. And what stinks about worrying is that Maybe you've been like me and you've lost sleep. You haven't slept because you're not getting as much sleep because you're worrying, you're thinking about it over and over again, or you can't think about anything else, or you're scared, you're frustrated, you're nervous. Maybe you've even gotten to the point where you, where you even have stomach pain because you're, you're worrying about something, you're so nervous about something. Well, he says, according to that phrase, he's saying that you can be worried Free. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take a pill and all of a sudden, boom, you're worry-free? That's not the case. He's saying, but you can be worry-free, and, and how much he says in this verse, in everything, so every circumstance. So now we're asking, okay, Paul, how do I become worry-free? How do I obtain this peace of God? Well, here's the key. Keep, in, in continuing that verse on verse 6, he says, 
By prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. What Paul is saying, the way that we obtain this peace is that we bring things before God and ask Him to help us in these things. Because let's remember who God is. God is all-powerful. He spoke, and this universe came into existence. He's in control of everything, from the smallest things to the biggest things. You know what this God says? He says, I love you. Before the world even began, I was thinking about you. Before you were even born, I died on a cross so that you can be free from your sin and have a relationship with me. He says that I, create, I was involved in creating every single part of your body when you were being formed. He says that I have been with you every step of the way. I've drawn you to myself so that you can be saved. God says, I love you so much. Cast your cares, your burdens on me. He says, I am there for you. So what helps me to have peace and be worry-free when I'm going through something hard and I want to just worry about it and try to control it, what brings me peace is to say, I can't handle this. God, I know that you love me. You're in control. I am giving this to you. I'm going to trust this to you. You know what's something we struggle with? Maybe we do that, but what do we want to do? We want to take it right back again. We just we say, I, I give it to you. Okay, i got to bring it back and worry about it some more. The hard thing is leaving, is, is leaving those burdens there. It's kind of like if I came up to you and, says, and, and I say, you know, I have a present for you. And then every time you try to grab it, I just do this. I have a present for you. And do this. That's what we tend to do with our trials. You know, maybe we get to the point where we say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. But then, then we pull it back. What will bring us peace is remembering how much God loves me and how he's in control and I'm going to leave that burden there. And then when my mind wants to worry about it again, I give it back to him. So giving my hardships, my trials to God helps me have this peace and worry in time of storm. So that's the major part. That, if you're going to take anything away from this message, take that away. Because maybe you're struggling with something right now, I encourage you to give it to God. But next what Paul does in verse 8, he gives some, some pointers on what to think about throughout the day that also helps with this peace. So uh, the next point is thinking thoughts that lead to peace. So look at verse 8 with me. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So what's key here, he talks about at the beginning of this verse, think on these things. Now, what does it mean here when he says to think? It's not just like you're just randomly doing something and just a random thought comes into your mind and then it goes the other way. How many of you are thinking, oh, I need to do this, and then boom, that thought's gone. And you're just like, how many of you walk into a room and you're like, what was I going to do here? <laughs> We're not just talking about a thought that just comes and goes. The idea here, you could translate this as reason. It means to chew, to think on something, to ponder. Kind of like, any of you like riddles? Maybe. So here's some riddles, and I want you to see if you can think about, if you can reason, if you can ponder and try to figure out what this means. Oh. Uh, here we go. You can see me in water, but I never get wet. What am I? A reflection, good. Uh, next. Uh, okay. oh, oh, you didn't see that. What belongs to you, but others use it more than you do? Oh, you might say your name. All right, last one. What has a heart, but no other organs? Anyone? A deck of cards. <laughs> so these kind of things you have to think through, you have to ponder. So Paul is saying that we should be thinking on certain things. And what we're going to see is Paul is going to describe something, and in order to apply it, we're going to think, okay, what should I not think about in regards to this? What is, so don't do this. What is fine for me to think about in regards to this? And what is best? And we're going to notice that 
pretty much every time the best thing to think about is stuff that refers to God's truth, God's word, which goes in line with what we're studying about feeding the spirit produces this fruit of peace. So look at verse 8. The first thing he says here, what should we think on? He says things that are true. So this is the opposite of lies. So who, does anybody know who this is? Pinocchio. Pinocchio. What was he known for? Lying. Wouldn't it be kind of handy if uh, you went to someone, say you're buying something, and if they lied, their nose grew longer? <laughs> you're like, ah, you can't, you can't fool me. Well, he's saying here that we should be thinking on things that are the opposite of lies. So here's an example. So things that we that don't do, don't think on things that they're claiming is no God. Could be, and really, any of these things that don't could be from. Tons of different areas. Could be people, could be entertainment, could be uh, music. I mean, you name it. We can get any of these philosophies, and if we tend, if we want, to, if we think on these things and apply it, that can take away the peace. So, um, so don't don't think on don't think on things that are claiming there is no God. So don't do that. What's fine to think about? Well, thinking about secular things that don't do things that are claiming there is no God. But what's best is focus on truth that brings a true understanding of the world and God that are according to the Bible. So, reading and thinking about the Bible. Now, you're going to notice we're going to hit a lot of these pretty quick. I don't really want to focus a lot on these, but I want to go through these because this is what Paul talks about in this passage. So, the next one is honest. means correct moral principles. So, examples, don't think on things uh, that portray moral things that are morally bad, like adultery, lies, anything against the Ten Commandments, anything that's promoting things that are against the Bible, saying this is what's great, this is what's going to bring you joy, don't have your thoughts totally consumed with those things. What's fine to think about? Thinking on things that don't portray moral things that are morally bad, and best, thinking on things that, are, that present biblically moral things. And so when we're talking about thinking on biblically things, this could be from Music could be <coughs> fellowship, could be reading your Bible, could be coming to church, all these these type of things. Next, he says, think on things that are just. That means holy. Now, oftentimes when we think of holy, we think of just being not not sinning. That's part of it, but it also means separate from sin to God. That's what it's talking about there. So examples of this. Uh, don't think on things that embrace things that are against God's nature. For instance, things that things like God is good, God is loving, God is completely separate from sin. So thinking on things that are opposite of that. Um, what's fine, think on things that are not against God's nature. And best, think on things that are separate from evil and push you to God. So next, he says, think on things that are pure. That means innocent and not dirty. I'm sure none of your children ever look like this. I don't know about your kids, but if Clay's ever playing in a room by himself and he's quiet, that's a bad sign. He was doing that once we came in, and we have desitin, which is like white stuff to put on their butts, you know, when they're, um, when they're in diapers, and he had a cake from head to toe. And that stuff is water resistant, so getting that off was a chore. So, He's saying the opposite of this. Don't think on things, think on things that are dirty. Uh, think on things that are pure. So an example of this, uh, don't think on things that are dirty, things that take good things, clean things, and pervert them and drag them through the dirt of sin. So there's lots of good things that God gives us in this life. And what the world likes to do is to take that, twist it, and turn it into something dirty. He's saying, don't be consumed, don't be constantly thinking about those things. What's fine to think about, thinking on things that are not dirty, what's best, thinking on things that are sinless. For example, the Bible. Uh, next he says, think on things that are lovely. Lovely means beautiful, kind of like thinking, um, looking at something like this, it's really pretty. Uh, with, as you know, last week I was on vacation, and one of the places we went and saw was the Grand Canyon. And how many of you have been to the North Rim? How many of you have been to that lodge where you can you look out the window? Well, at the North Rim, 
you can go into this lodge and you can look out the window and it's this beautiful view of the Grand Canyon. And we're like, Clay, look at look, it's the Grand Canyon. What does Clay do? He sees a little rock. And he's like, ooh, that looks cool. And he's completely <laughs> missing the pretty view, right? Well, it's talking about here, look, think on things that are beautiful. So an example, don't think on things that are beautiful. Don't think on things that take something beautiful and make it dirty. For instance, taking beautiful actions for marriage and, and twisting them to do something outside of man, marriage. Also, foul language would, would fall in this category. What's fine, think on things that don't take something beautiful and make it dirty. Best, think on things that highlight the beauty of God and his creation, once again, from the Bible. Um, next is good report and virtue. Good report means uh, commendable good reputation, and virtue means excellence. So this, these are the last two we're looking at. So, for example, don't think on things that are not done, for, done well for self-gratification. What's fine, thinking on things that don't have things... Uh, that are not done well, best thinking on things that are done well for God's glory. So when we're talking about thoughts here, a lot of the day we don't really get to choose what we're going to think about. You have to think about your job, and you have to think about you know, family, you, know, you, you name it. There's things that you have to think about. But the question is, what do you think about when you have the opportunity to think about? And when you have that opportunity, if you think on things that are from a biblical standpoint, biblical truths, those things will help develop that peace of God that God offers you. So this goes in line with the, with the feeding the Spirit, and that produces these fruit of the Spirit, and today is peace. So in conclusion, what is your worry and anxiety level like? Because this is a natural thing that we all struggle with. Something hard comes into our life, what do we naturally do? Worry about it. We get nervous about it. We think about it over and over again. And if we let it, it takes over our life. And when we do that, it can even, it, it can even make us upset and even hurt people around us. Well, here's the key, and we've already hit on this. The God that loves you so much is in control of this circumstance you are in. That's hard to grasp, because we think, why would God allow this? And we've been talking about this in Sunday school with the book of Job on why we go through hard times. Well, God bring, allows these hard times to come in our life, because sometimes it's like God has to kick out the crutches for us to really turn back to him. We, we kind of think, oh, I've got life on my own. I, I've got this handled. God's like, no, life is much better when you're relying on me. So he sometimes has to allow these hard things into our life to kind of wake us up. Sometimes we have to, hopefully God can just nudge us, and we're like, oh yeah. But sometimes he's got to like make us hit rock bottom before we really awaken. I know I've heard people's testimonies before they were saved that God was really trying to work on them, and they're saying, no God, no God. And then they got um, the guy that led me to the Lord. He, he got in a, a car wreck. A, or a motorcycle wreck and was in the hospital for like six weeks. That really woke him up and he got saved. Uh, my father-in-law fell off a ladder, broke his back, and, and he got saved. Sometimes God has to really shake us up, but one of the reasons he allows these hardships is so that if we turn to him in these hard times, it helps us become more joyful and satisfied in the end. So that's kind of a shortened version of one of the reasons why God allows these hardships. So I remember that God is allowing this for a reason. And he loves me and he's in control of these things. That helps me to be able to let go of the hardship I'm going through and give it to God. It's kind of like if you're carrying a super heavy burden and it's just weighing you down. If you can give that to someone else to carry, that weight is off your shoulders, you feel way better. The idea of when we're trying to control and hold on and carry these hardships on our own, God says, no, no, cast those on me. It's kind of like, let's say you're, you're unpacking, you're moving, and your child wants to carry, come on, help. 
your child wants to ah. carry, carry all these carry all these boxes by himself. As you can tell, this is Photoshop. This yeah. child isn't really doing this. It's kind of like the child is trying to carry all this, and you're saying, no, 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 I'll, I'll carry it for you. I'm stronger. That's what God says to us. He says, you are not meant to bear this burden alone. He says, I'm stronger than you. Give, give it to me. I'll, I'll carry this load for you. Now, it doesn't mean I give it to God and just do nothing about it. No. It means that I'm going to trust that God is going to help me do the right thing in this circumstance. And I'm going to trust that he's going to help me through this. So I encourage you, if you're going through something hard today, cast it on God. But you know what's so easy to do? Maybe cast it on God. I think it even be minutes later. I want to take it right back. And it's just remembering God loves me. He's in control. I'm going to give it to him. And as we do that more and more, it helps us in the long run. And like we just talked about, our thought life will help determine whether or not we're going to have this peace. So I encourage you, get God's truth into your life. Read God's word. Listen to Christian music. Come to church. Be around Christian friends and, friends and family. All those things will help develop that peace in your life. So the major takeaway for today is praise the Lord that he sacrificed himself that, so that we can be his children. If you've, been, if you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, you will never be able to obtain this peace that passes understanding. So if you have not seen that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior and you want to start that relationship with Jesus today and have this peace, please come talk to me about it. And we, when we talk about the peace that passes understanding. I heard a story once. Well, this, this family came to our church when I was interning in Nashville and described their personal testimony. And something that had happened to them, they, they were traveling. It was a mother and father who had five kids. And they got and they were traveling in a van and they went over some metal or something on the highway. It hit the back of the van and made the back of the van explode or go on fire, something like that. I don't remember the details exactly, but what happened was mother and dad were fine. All five kids died. And the news was interviewing them right after. And they said that God gave them so much power and peace that they were able to tell the news that we know that God has a plan for this. We know that God's in control. So we have, we, we're going to be okay through this. Can you imagine that? Whatever God has called you to go through, he can give you the peace to go through it. And as we cast our cares on him, he will help us do that. So praise the Lord that we have this help in time of storm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we don't have to go through life on our own. There's so many hardships, and um, we just thank you that you love us. You're in control. And that there is a reason we are going through this hardship. I pray that you would give us the grace and strength to trust you in this hard time. To realize you love us and you're in control. I pray that we find peace in you. And we thank you for your love. In your name, amen.